All right, thank you everyone for logging in and spending your lunch hour with us. I certainly appreciate it. Sorry we're a couple minutes late. Um, but we would like to take a few minutes to recognize and thank our annual partners. The chapter's annual partners have helped carry the chapter during the pandemic and we appreciate their continued partnership and support of the industry. Our gold annual partners are here and we wanna thank them for their annual partnership. And thank you to our silver annual partners as well. The chapter has an exciting event planned for next week. The membership committee is hosting a member only virtual wind down Wednesday. The event will begin with a private wine tasting from Tim, from Tim's wine market as our sommelier of the evening, followed by wine and pop culture trivia and segmented networking. Registration is open right now on the NAOP Central Florida website, so please take a look. Again, this is presented by NAOP Central Florida, and I want to thank NAOP for having us today. I'm Amy Bolton with TLC Engineering for Architecture, and I will be one of your moderators today, as well as Devesh Nirmal with CounterPoint Energy Solutions with Resiliency Financing. We have some great panelists today that I would like to introduce. Our first is John Scott with Collier's, who is the Managing Director for REMS Florida and a member of Collier International Executive Leadership Team in Florida. John is a 30 plus year real estate asset management veteran and has direct responsibility and oversight of the Florida Real Estate Management Services Department, where he directs a portfolio of over 285 retail, office, and industrial properties totaling more than 32 million square feet. Our next panelist will be Larry Feldman with Feldman Equities. He has been directly responsible for the management and development or acquisition of over 11 million square feet of real estate with an aggregate value of over $3 billion during a career spanning over 35 years in the commercial real estate business. Mr. Feldman's primary focus over his career has been in the acquisition and redevelopment of office buildings. Feldman Equities is the largest private held owner of office buildings in the greater Tampa Bay area. Daniels unfortunately had an emergency today and is no longer able to present, but Devesh will be presenting most of his information for you. Um, Daniels is a real estate developer who owns several buildings in downtown Clearwater, including the Ring. Rebecca will be our fourth panelist today with Carrier. She is the global hospitality segment leader for Carrier within the Building Solutions Group. Prior to joining Carrier, she served as a national marketing director at PwC. Her current focus is driving Carrier's healthy buildings program that offers advanced solutions to help deliver healthier, safer, more efficient, and productive indoor environments across key verticals, including commercial, offices, healthcare, hospitality, education, and retail. She holds a master's degree from DePaul University and a bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our last panelist is Chris Castro with the City of Orlando. He is an award-winning sustainability professional, eco-entrepreneur, and community organizer with a passion for accelerating the transition to a smart, resilient, and sustainable future. Chris is currently the Director of Sustainability and co-chair of Smart Cities Initiative for Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer in the city of Orlando. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Amy, for uh, that great introduction and to the entire team at uh, NAOP for putting this together uh, as a team and the, and the uh, analysts. It's been really, I think we have an unprecedented time for all of us. We've said that over and over what we're going through. Um, and I think we've worked diligently to, from the inception of thinking about how, what the themes would be this year, to going through what we are with COVID-19, to really put together a panel that reflects a diversity of experiences, leadership, and innovation, which, of course, are the attributes we all can benefit from right now. And, um, you know, it's important that we are able to collectively deconstruct some of the terminology of smart buildings, optimization, resiliency, and the panels today will help us do that. I'll do my best to review a bit of what uh, Daniels was going to go over and just kind of speak to some of the things I've seen in that, that property and, and that uh, paradigm. Um, I'd like to kick off the process of, 
of this whole uh, uh, panel and, and what we can get out of it with two observations that come out of my own experience as a seasoned resiliency sustainability professional. Which right now I'm focused on, of course, how do we finance this future reality that needs to happen uh, sooner rather than later. So I, I think there's no doubt we can, we, we can see that the shocks and stresses that commercial office buildings and the larger communities, which uh, Chris will be able to talk about, are facing. Um, whether we speak of demand for flexible, temporary, short-term spaces, that changing demographic, growing challenges like climate change risk and impacts, or surprises like COVID-19, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious from what we are learning. These are best managed by, build, by building owners and developers that build into their design and operations the capacity to mitigate these risks and ultimately are able to reap the rewards of a more competitive, flexible, and profitable building operation or asset. Um, and there, number two, there are clear linkages between all these stresses and shocks through positive and negative feedback loops that you'll hear from some of the presenters today. I, I would say, frankly, from my uh, experience, ownerships that have invested, for example, in more energy efficient buildings that reduce operating costs, um, improve valuation and, and NOI, of course, um, also can probably better handle the higher standard of air quality ventilation that's coming with COVID-19. That's my own observation. Um, and I think um, overall, it's important then we, we, to, to really operationalize this, this buzzword of resiliency, you've got to be able to think in a systems fashion. You've got to be able to look at uh, the building systems, the occupants, the stakeholders in the community um, across the life cycle of the building from purchase, uh, building, repositioning, uh, adaptive reuse, whatever that might be. With that, I would, I would say we did start with a, um, a survey of registrants that went out uh, yesterday um, or the day before. And just one of the observations we got out of that was a question around what factors are most important for enhancing the resiliency of office buildings. Given that it's COVID-19, it's no surprise that the, uh, the very significant um, category of response was around healthy working environment, ventilation, air quality, and hygiene, and cleaning. A close second uh, at 50% uh, voting for significant and 37.5% voting for very significant was energy efficiency. And um, I think these are uh, not surprise, surprising to hear about. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. And uh, John is a colleague of mine. We've worked uh, on a lot of think projects and initiatives together and continue to do so. Um, you know, John, I think, uh, thank you for being here with all your experience. You know, um, first question, I'm gonna ask questions. You kind of know what they are. I think we'll, we'll be able to have you just respond with, through your presentation. So how does COVID-19 fit within the paradigm of resiliency management? Is it an anomaly or is it part of the continuum of high performance buildings that you've gotten to know? Um, and then the second question we want to know is, you know, you've been balancing this, this whole world of sustainability and resiliency with the day-to-day -day reality of maintaining and improving the financial performance of everything from institutional class A portfolios to class B and C privately owned buildings. What are clients making, why are, sorry, why are clients making these type of investments? Um, and what, what can we learn about what needs to be done in the future? So John, if you want to take it away, we look forward to it. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Devesh, and thank you, Nayop, for asking us to join and my other panelists, which I know all of them, and Amy and Sandy and Lindsay have done a great job. So first off, I appreciate that. Um, let me put up my slides, and I'm going to try and answer some of your questions, Devesh, and then put in Q&A, you can expound upon them if you would like. So first off, Devesh was speaking to resiliency. Everyone has a different opinion what resiliency. The one item that I, I think everyone agrees is shock, uh, shocks or stressors to the system. And that is in communities, that's in buildings, that's in people because there's such a thing as a COVID-19 uh, mindset that's being explored by scientists right now. So how, how has it changed everyone's perception of the world? And I think you hit on a number of great items, uh, Devesh, but first let me start with my first slide. I, I love Sir Winston Churchill, where he says, never let a good crisis go to waste. So, so what are we finding out about ourselves? What are we finding out about our buildings? What are we finding out about our country and how we weather these, these stressors? Um, Sir Winston was in the middle of World War II when he made this statement, and while COVID-19 is a global phenomenon, that was a war that encompassed the entire world. So he had some unique perspectives, and I've kind of added some of those into what we look at. But I'm going to talk about COVID-19 first and how it's made us look at our buildings, and particularly resilient buildings. And to answer your question, 
uh, Devesh, I think it's part of the continuum of an efficient building, a sustainable building, and a resilient building. So Colliers, I worked on the National Reentry Program. I also have worked with Bowman International and theirs in Miami-Dade County, and we put this all together. And what I found out first off is the people who had went through their buildings and had created resiliency, sustainable plans, first off, knew their buildings better than the majority of the other participants in our surveys. And what does that mean? That means they've studied their buildings, they've looked at them from different perspectives. And you brought up an interesting one, Devesh, with HVAC. In our resilient buildings where we've retrofitted and we've put in higher efficiency units, you made the point about how much outside air can we bring in and how we can use the, the approved filters for it and still have reduced costs. And that's part of one of the great strategies that has worked for us. I would tell you in most all of our our resilient buildings or retrofitted buildings, we've seen an increase, uh, a negligible increase in the cost of energy, even with full outside air going on. Whereas in other buildings that have not been retrofitted, I see a 30 or 40% energy consumption usage. And you got to understand that's only with the 50% load on the building. So I think that is a very important factor that when we get all this data from this COVID-19 reentry program, that you're going to see that it, it was an extremely valuable from an energy perspective. And I think from Larry's perspective, when he's out, uh, you know, doing these lease and deals and, and everything else, that it's valuable for him to say, hey, our costs are lower, our, our pass-throughs are lower. Uh, the other one is in most of the resilient buildings, we've already added contactless water faucets, urinals, everything that nature, doors, because we want to control the access points, we want to control the water usage. And so you're, you're away from the hand controlled units in most of those buildings. Again, that was easy for us to either lock down entrances, change how you entered and exited the building, and how you were utilizing the restrooms and everything else. You could just physically turn off the, the um, actual uh, eyes on these different devices and only one would work in the restroom and part of the Miami-Dade protocol is only one person can go into a smaller restroom at a time. So it, it, it actually helped us with that but also the energy and I mean the water consumption out of those buildings were 40 percent lower on average through the buildings we've retrofitted throughout the state um, than some that have manual or ones that are just controlled by outside sources. So I think those are two important items to answer your question, and that makes it part of the continuum to me. The lighting is, is another item that I think is very important, and I think Larry's gonna to touch on this later with his, his UV lighting, so I'm not going to venture into that, but again, that's an energy reduction, but also inhibits some of the growth uh, potential that's going on from this virus. Um, and I think that's very important to acknowledge too. And the type of materials you're putting in the building are typically more resilient to this virus living on, whether it's the, uh, the wall coverings or on the flooring or anything else. So I think that's very important for you to take in consideration. And just mentioning with the BOMA reentry program, we were putting out a, a guide that I've worked on for the business continuity plan and for handling vendors and, and legal issues that will be coming out shortly. But I bring that up because the liabilities from a prospective investor on a, a building that has been retrofitted is resilient and sustainable is to look at those type of initiatives that have been put in place, but how is that helping them and their liabilities in a COVID-19 or in any other type of exposure as we were talking about a shock or stressor to the system. I think that adds a significant value and I'll get into that later on as we go. But a couple of environmental items that I was just amazed at, we were talking about doing more outside air. We've had the cleanest outside air in Florida that we've had in, in generations. But one in particular impressed me when I was going through some of the the stats after we've been in lockdown for over two months was Los Angeles. And they had air pollution issues for the past hundred years. And in fact, the air pollution in Los Angeles, some due to less you know, manufacturing, less cars on the road, but 
since 1934, they had had higher pollution than this. And that's amazing to me that it's almost 100 years to, for that change. So there's other factors that were involved with it, the weather and everything else, and you can read the studies on it, but the fact of the minimal impact from cars and manufacturing it's created is just amazing to me. And then one other item, which I thought was phenomenal, in India, they were unable to see Mount Everest for the past 30 years because of manufacturing in multiple cities. And as you can look at it now, it's a perfect view for them. Again, going back to what did we do during this time? What lessons can we learn from it? And how do we take those lessons into the future and utilize them so that we have a balance? Because I don't think there's a, a new norm going on. In fact, I think the resilient building is going to have more people uh, moving to them, wanting to lease those, being involved with them, not just from that, the perspective of energy savings or resiliency, but from the fact that they're healthier buildings in an all around fashion. And I think that they're gonna hold their value because of that, and I'm sure Larry will speak to that. So when we look at reentry with the energy resiliency and financing, and I know you're my finance guy, Devash, but, and you know a lot more about this, but when we were looking at how we re-entered, a lot of the items come back with the MERV 13 filters that we had to add in, how we were opening more outside air, and how we were able to um, you know, utilize ultraviolet or germicide irradiation in some of them, and Larry's going to speak to that in detail. But the key operations that I'm going to go back to is the people in those buildings understood their building better. They were able to produce a plan in my portfolio throughout the state immediately because they understood how their building flows, what their equipment is, what they can maintain, where others had to go and, and figure out what their systems were able to handle. So what did that mean? We called the owners and be able to respond immediately to what their questions So We were able to put together guides for entering, exiting, you know, what it looked like to space out the 50% load and what the impact would be on the buildings. And that was very positive to the majority of our clients. So when we look at it in the continuum, we're looking at what the drivers are. COVID-19 added a new driver that we hadn't really considered, even though we do in healthy buildings. But how do we mitigate it going into the future? So we looked at it from an energy side. We looked at it from a cost side. We looked at it from investment side. Now we're looking at it from a whole different medical side where how can these buildings be made resilient going into the future and that's a question i'm getting from a lot of people uh, or investors who've invested in these type of buildings they're saying well how can i plan for this pandemic which is part of the reason i'm working on the business uh, continuity plans is so when we build out a new tenant space what is that going to look like is it going to be more dense or less dense more than likely, we're going to reduce some of the densification that's happened over the past few years. On the other side, the materials that are go going to go into this space are going to look different too. How does it minimize the spread of a virus? How does it negate, um, whether it's on the door handles using some form of you know, self-sanitizing materials? How are we going to change everything to automatic openings instead of people grabbing handles? knobs, pushing buttons, and all of those different areas. So I think it's going to be a dramatic change into the investment as the world figures out how to deal with the pandemic, both now and into the future. So one of the case studies I wanted to talk about in which I was personally involved with is a tower in downtown Tampa called Park Center. And Park Park has been around since 1973. It's one of our great success stories in Tampa and, and Larry purchased it uh, from the previous owner Sterling, which I was involved with in Collier's, uh, leased and managed it during that time and Larry's team has taken it and, and moved it forward. And one of our goals during that time in which Larry has moved forward and we'll talk about was to try and reposition it as potentially a B minus C plus building just due to its age and lack of efficiency and, and lack of renovation in it. And we started going through the, the control systems, through the chiller systems. We invest about $13 million of the ownership money at the time, Sterling, because they wanted to change that building into a B plus, A minus building. 
And we were able through that investment that they put into the building, and some of that was build outs in common areas too, guys, but chiller replacements, uh, plumbing work, we were able to reduce the energy cost by 50% during that retrofit. We were able to change the flow of the traffic into the buildings um, and updating the elevators. We were also able to reduce water consumption significantly for the building. And we were awarded a, a lead gold uh, platform for that, which was something that our client wanted. And we were only a couple points out of platinum, but since Tampa only had um, the highest rated building or what was considered class A was gold, they felt that was enough to accomplish during that time. But they were also able to start raising some of the rental rates, which is part of Larry's story because he took it from that point and has moved it dramatically up. And I think in talking about why the continuum is, no one looked at that 1973 tower and thought it could be a part of class A buildings. And, and the class A buildings may not recognize it as that, but in the marketplace, it is seen as a, 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 a new building, a new project. And when we posted our 99 Energy Star rating after we completed all the upgrades, all of the A buildings said that can't be possible in, in that time. And so <laughs> we, we showed them how we went and we were able to accomplish that. So now it's on equal footing with those buildings, both from a lead rating, from an Energy Star rating, from a an energy uh, reduction cost rating, it actually is one of the best, I think, in the state when we reviewed it back four years ago. So I think that is very important to look at the continuum. I think it's important to note that that's even going to change more forward. And I know Larry will add more to this uh, discussion points. But I just want to put out my last slide, which is my, my favorite slide ever. The greatest use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. So Appreciate this time and I'll look forward to the questions and answers. John, thank you so much. And thank you for leaving us with an inspirational uh, piece while we're trying to get through what is a very short-term uh, stressful crisis. And, and to think long-term is really gonna be that, you know, those that can do that will be rewarded. I think to that point, John, as you gather more data, uh, as you mentioned on how different types of buildings are faring through this, I think we'd love to see that. We have a follow-up post that we're planning to do based on the, um, uh, the survey we started, the pre-event pre survey. So if we could work together on that and, and make sure that the membership and registrants are, uh, get the benefit of that follow through, we'd really appreciate that, John. I'm gonna go we'll ahead have to work on that. Beautiful, thanks. Um, so not to uh, delay uh, Larry's presentation too much. Larry, I think you know, we queued you up nicely. Uh, John made a reference to one of the uh, successful office buildings that's currently in your portfolio. We certainly would like to know more about how that high performance orientation fits into your overall competitive and resilient business model. And furthermore, has that high performance positioning of, of your assets enabled you to respond more effectively and competitively to the higher uh, operational requirements? I'll, I'll let it let you go. Thank you so much. We can see your slides. Larry, can you unmute if you're speaking? Um, Larry, I think you're muted. Can you just hit your uh, little un mute button there down at the corner left? There we go. Got it now. Sorry about that, guys. No worries. Uh, no worries. I needed a millennial in the room. Uh, <laughs> Can you hop back to your slides? Just uh, hit the share screen again. Absolutely. Or uh, um, choose, there we go, we're good, thank you. How is that? We uh, have a slideshow now? Okay, good. Uh, John, thanks very much for the plug on Park Tower. We're very proud of that acquisition and what we've done to that building. When we first bought that building, I got up in front of a large group of people and said, I'm proud to announce we bought the ugliest building in Tampa. And then uh, a few people cringed, including my son. And uh, my son said, Dad, why did you say that? 
And they said, well, you have to keep expectations low in our business. And then you surprise on the upside. And that little anecdote really describes what we do as a company. We buy underperforming office buildings in great locations. We're heavily invested in the Tampa Bay area. We own and manage 2.3 million square feet of office space. And every building that we buy has a plan behind it, which is to take the building all the way up in quality from typically when we buy it at a B level quality all the way to A. So we do the obvious things, which is we gut lobbies and we have a medical procedure for that. Uh, we, we call that a lobbyectomy. Um, I'll show you an example of that uh, right here in, in the slide off to the left. That's our first central tower building, which incidentally looks a lot like the park tower lobby. And we put in all sorts of amenities, uh, full service fitness centers, chill zones, which are 24 seven areas where tenants can hang out, have a cappuccino and conference facilities that are large conference boardroom type facilities, all of which we pretty much give for free or virtually for free to our tenants. And that is designed to drive occupancy and ultimately drive rents, but initially, the, the game plan is to drive occupancy by using the renovation to attract new tenants. So when we renovate a building, we focus on the high profile areas that you're seeing on this slide. But we also upgrade other parts of the building, that, not just the gingerbread, so to speak, but we also upgrade the mechanical system. So as John alluded to, all of our buildings undergo a complete uh, revamp of the air conditioning systems. Uh, typically we put in brand new elevator systems, not just the, the elevator cabs, but the entire elevator system is replaced. We put in energy management systems in all of our buildings. We've retrofitted everything with LED lighting. And as a result of all of these efforts going into this COVID situation, we were about 93% least across our portfolio. So that has positioned us better, I think, than most of our competitors um, from a, a portfolio standpoint. Uh, this is an example of one of the new chillers that we put in. Um, we, we put in uh, state-of-the-art train systems or other top uh, of the line carrier systems into our buildings with energy management. And as a result of all of this, I think we, we, we're far better positioned uh, going into this because we have the cash flow now to do certain things to take our building to the next level to protect it for COVID. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Devesh. Sorry, yes, very much so, thank you. Good. Okay. Um, are you still going, Larry? I didn't know if you had other slides really quick. You wanted to sure, focus. sure. Yeah, we can uh, talk about um, some of the things that we're doing. Yeah, let's just skip right to the COVID. That'd be great. Uh, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is, this uh, is, the next slide uh, is actually a video that I'm going to show is by a company called UV Angel, which gives you an overview of one of the things that we're piloting in our buildings, which is dealing with UV lighting. UV lighting has been around for 20 years, and I'll just uh, introduce this video for you right now.
Larry, do you want to make any of your points on the technology that you're like the investment and while this video is going, just so we can kind of cover, sure. it, move this along? That appreciate it. This uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, this um, this system that you just saw is a system which is ceiling mounted. It can be put in any office. It's currently being used in hospitals throughout the country. And it is a proven technology. As I said, the, the UV light uh, kills up to 99.99% .99 of the pathogens in the space. So we're piloting this now in one of our buildings. And as it uh, begins to develop and we begin to get confidence in it, we're going to actually expand from there. Another uh, item that we're uh, working on right now is electrocharging air with ionization. Uh, this is um, also a technology that's been around for quite a while. And what it does is that it actually ionizes the air and creates an ozone effect. And in the process actually kills the pathogens in the space. Uh, so that's another very promising technology. Um, this is a, a shot of the New York City subway system. At night, they are actually using UV lighting. There are different types of treatment. This is an intense UV lighting. You notice there's nobody in the cab because it's not safe to treat the space while people are in. But there actually are different types of UV light spectrum that are safe to humans. And in fact, uh, there's a laboratory up uh, in Cambridge at Harvard where uh, 100 mice uh, that are uh, hairless mice have been exposed to this different spectrum of UV light for a year now, and there's been no harmful effects. So all of this is all very promising technology, which we're beginning uh, to pilot in our buildings. This is uh, a, a self-cleaning button for elevators and other uh, button press surfaces. So every time you actually press the button, it actually self cleans. Uh, and it's a technology that's uh, about 99.99% effective on, um, uh, the, um, on the COVID. So why are we doing all of this? Well, our, our philosophy has always been to keep our buildings full uh, obviously, people are talking about work from home. There's uh, situations now where people are, are saying, uh, oh, well, nobody, maybe nobody ever returns to the office, and perhaps office buildings will become uh, Amazon delivery centers. Uh, I personally don't believe that's going to happen. Um, I think people need people. There's no such thing as company culture unless you're in a real office face-to-face -face with people. And by the way, uh, if you're middle management uh, or lower management wanting to become middle or upper management, you're unlikely to be promoted from home. So we want people back to work. And how do we get them back to work? It is by making our buildings safer, cleaner spaces to occupy. And we're, we're doing all the low tech stuff, the masks, we're giving out masks for free to all of our tenants. Uh, we're obviously limiting elevator use to two people per elevator. Uh, with distancing guidelines. So all of that stuff you've heard about, we're doing, uh, but we think we need to do more to make our buildings more COVID resistant. And all of the things we've done with energy efficiency systems, with HVAC replacements, uh, with pushing the leasing up as high as we could going into this crisis has made us more, let's say, COVID resistant. I would not say COVID proof. Uh, but that completes my presentation, Devesh. Please let me know if you have any other questions. No, I think that was beautiful. You, you tapped on some very emergency, emerging technologies and trends, and you also tied it back to your, I would say, I'd call that resilient, you know, your COVID-19 resilient because of those, the continuum that John mentioned that you were, you've been on. You're able to just take this in stride and, and provide leadership with the, uh, the new technology. So we really appreciate that insight. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up. Um, we're uh, trying to get through this uh, successfully with the time limit we have. Thank you again, Larry. I'm gonna go ahead and shift. And Daniels is not with us today. I'm just gonna say a few words about his building and his orientation. Um, so let me just get to that right now. Okay. So 
So uh, Daniels is the owner of a, of a couple of, of uh, office towers and types of buildings uh, in, in Tampa Bay as well and, and some other parts of Florida that he's looking at. One of the properties that he acquired, which is also a kind of a legacy office building is one Clearwater Tower. Um, the city of Clearwater is one of the uh, tenants. And, and interestingly enough, he has his own separate shared working space business. So if you step back and I you remember what I said about the demand for flexible shared working spaces, which of course has seen a, seen a, uh, a hit too with COVID-19 and how that's supposed to work. But early on, you know, Daniels realized that that space had to be something inviting on multiple levels to the demographic that was looking to use it. So he was seeking well certification. Well certification is a healthy building certification. Part of that is very high standards on indoor air quality to promote human health, especially in a connected space like that. So once again, on this continuum, if you're making those investments early on, you're thinking broadly about that investment, you're able to then step into this COVID-19 situation much more um, you know, prepared and, and, and come out of it successfully. So I think really that's, uh, let me just step down to show you some of these um, uh, slides really quick. So, I mean, overall, uh, he, you know, he's been doing a continuous improvement on energy uh, p consumption. He's got a unique type of lease structure for the gross lease where he can continue to increase uh, the lease as he reduces operating costs. So he's been on a journey. He's got some fundamental upgrades that he needs to get done nonetheless. Um, uh, the, the part that's gonna tie to the, the next presenter too is around the, the fact that this building is part of a study with Harvard on the cognitive function uh, the productivity of human beings in, in greener and more healthier buildings. So there are some data collection pieces going on with his, the ring shared workspace, as I mentioned. Um, and it, it ties all these different variables together. Um, he's obviously doing very good. I just had a meeting actually in one of his, in his property uh, last week on the, the immediate stuff that you've got to do to make these spaces inviting and, and healthy and, and liability free. Um, Let's see here. Um, this is the ring. You notice the, 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 the green wall, the whole strategy there. Obviously, there's a biophilia piece of this, but there's also data points around air quality that they're tracking related to their efforts. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, just want to make everybody aware of the orientation that Daniel's had going into this with using some third party certifications and some uh, piloting of, of, of new concepts uh, with uh, the educational institutions. We all can do that in the commercial space. There's plenty of opportunity to collaborate and work on some of these projects together. Um, and the cognitive function study, which uh, uh, Rebecca will be going over, uh, you know, basically some key findings here is that, uh, you know, um, this cognitive function can be much higher in, in greener buildings, 61%, and, and enhanced conditions where you have um, mitigated the carbon dioxide, the, the volatile organic compounds, uh, and you have the right kind of ventilation rate, you've got even greater productivity. Um, all relevant to COVID-19 and overall the continuum we're talking about. But with that, I, what I think I will do is if we have any questions for Daniels and it's what he's trying to do, we can certainly follow up with him. So right now I'd like to turn it over to, um, give me a second here. Um, let's see. Rebecca, you can share your screen and I'm gonna go ahead and um, just prompt you with some questions. So, you know, having just heard about the uh, Harvard connection of the building that Daniels has in, in Clearwater to the COG ethics study, I mean, we'd like to hear more about the smart building program and how you tie in with that. Um, you know, COVID is obviously bringing this to the forefront. So anything we can understand of how to, how this all ties together and how, to, how do we access that sort of orientation. And then finally, um, to specialize in HVAC, um, you know, usually the top ranking expense for mechanical equipment in a building, what do you see as some of the most prudent strategies for managing HVAC and controls investments? If you can touch upon that in our limited time, whatever you can do. Thank you. I'll, sure. try. I'll try to quickly go through this. I want to make sure we have time for some Q&A. So um, yeah. thank you so much for um, having the opportunity here to present today. Um, what I'm consistently hearing on this call so far is that, you know, resilient building, you know, the, the need for resiliency in our buildings but the way I kind of view it is that resilient buildings are both high performing as well as healthy buildings. So that's why I decided to take this uh, path of calling this presentation the healthy buildings because that's how we're uh, viewing it uh, at Carrier. Um, so just to kind of give you a perspective of where I'm coming from, I thought I'd give a, a one minute overview of Carrier. Um, many of you know uh, Carrier from HVAC, you know, from my air conditioning system. 
Uh, but certainly we have a full portfolio, including life safety, security, and building automation. And then um, more broadly, Carrier recently became a public standalone company uh, earlier this year, and we're about a $19 billion company, uh, 55,000 employees globally, uh, and, and lots of brands. These were just a few of them, but we have over 80 brands um, that are very well recognized and industry leading. So that just provides a little bit of perspective. Um, I actually sit in the building solutions group at Carrier. Um, so even though we have many brands and many capabilities, um, within my group, we actually try to work with customers um, around the world with key accounts and focusing on um, you know, the, the things that can help them, particularly around increasing energy and operational efficiency, uh, enhancing their occupant experience, and then improving the health, safety, and security of the occupants inside. And the way we do that within Building Solutions is that obviously we're going to lead with our advanced products, but then we also have various controls or advanced solutions, um, advisory capabilities, and then uh, we have uh, an advanced tech team, which is really a, uh, I mean, I work with them daily. They're an amazing skilled group of engineers um, across the globe, and we can pilot uh, different solutions with customers. Uh, and particularly as it relates to COVID and other uh, scenarios, uh, this team and other engineers within, um, within Carrier are really working um, on developing some new solutions um, to address the pandemic and certainly beyond. Um, so then I'm going to switch gears here and kind of talk about the research that you were just talking about um, previously, Devash, and introducing it for Daniels, which is um, starting in 2015, Carrier, we've been a longstanding, you know, obviously with our name and HVAC, we've and you know, the founder of Modern Air and Conditioning, uh, we've been in, you know, certainly the thermal comfort and making sure that occupants are comfortable in buildings, uh, but we've also been in healthy building space for many years. And in 2015, we started the COG FX. Um, study. Uh, if you want to search it later, it's just C-O-G-F uh, as in Frank X as in X-ray study.com. Uh, but you can go to the COG FX study and actually see the three-part study that Carrier funded, uh, which was done by um, uh, independently by uh, Harvard University. And really, the, this was the first time uh, of, you know, in this kind of research where it was examining the relationship between indoor environment and the occupant's um, cognitive um, performance. And so what this proved out, and again, you guys can all look online, but it proved out um, that Harvard proved out um, is that you know, these green buildings or in, you know, these enhanced environments um, where the building is actually healthy, uh, low VOC, enhanced ventilation, and other things um, in the study that you can look at, but these enhanced buildings can have absolutely incredible benefits to occupants. So across the top there, you can see that there's like an increase of 299% uh, improved ability to use information, 131% improvement in responding to a crisis. I mean, I think if I had a surgeon operating on me and they had these types of uh, improvements, I would want that surgeon working on me or have my accountant doing my taxes, uh, you know, with these types of environments, uh, you know, working in this type of built environment. Um, so I say that jokingly, but it really was a phenomenal study um, showing that, uh, you know, in an academic environment um, that, you know, we can actually do these things, deliver a healthy building and have these kinds of results on occupants. And then beyond the cognitive function, there's also the improvement to personal health. So we, um, uh, the Harvard uh, University T.H. Chan School of Public Health also found that people were having improvements in their sleep quality. So, you know, better night's sleep, which also equates to less absenteeism. So you have higher um, work productivity. You have people who are in the office. They're operating at a higher level. Um, I mean, all in all, again, having the ability to deliver a healthy building is a direct impact on the occupants and uh, them living better lives because you're creating a better built environment. And certainly there's a bottom line impact as well um, in improving the society as a whole. Um, the, and, um, you know, just with the reduction of energy costs and having health and climate benefits. So um, we've touched a little bit about the current environment. I know John was mentioning earlier that COVID added like a brand new driver to um, create a healthy building. And it certainly is, without a doubt, a driver. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. And certainly now more than ever, there's a dire need to have a healthy building. Um, and there's the need, as Larry was saying, to minimize disease transmission with UV lights, uh, various you know, technologies that are out there. Uh, certainly within HVAC, we have filtration, we have UV lights, 
we have a lot of different capabilities, you know, photostatic capability. We have a lot of capabilities within HVAC to uh, at carrier to minimize disease transmission uh, in the built environment. Um, but also on the flip side, beyond just products, you have occupants who are going into these environments who have new expectations. They want to ensure before they come back to the office that their health is safety, health and safety um, is you know, top of mind is being addressed in their, as they're working uh, or shopping or commuting uh, in, in these environments. So this means that buildings are going to have to get updated. And I know John touched on it, so did Larry, about how things are being updated in the building, but it also requires some new thinking around designing of new buildings as well as um, retrofitting the existing ones. So um, I showed on the prior slide that, you know, we all spend about 90% of our time indoors so it's really important now, again, more than ever, to really ensure that we're delivering that indoor experience as a healthy one. So um, just very briefly here, again, Carrier has a, a wide range of uh, product solution services that we can work and we have been working with our customers for, well, 120 years. Um, but within the commercial building space, we really have um, identified three prioritized needs um, for um, buildings. Um, again, these are different for the different verticals that we focus on, but within commercial buildings, it really is about improving the occupant wellness, enhancing occupant thermal comfort, and ensuring um, that occupants are safe and secure or you know, have uh, an environment that um, delivers both safety and security. Um, so very briefly in you know, occupant wellness, obviously we can de deliver filters, we have well advisory services, we have induction beams, um, that bring in, you know, do, uh, outdoor air or doaz. And then we have this brand new OptiClean, which is kind of like a gray closet, <laughs> but, it, you know, this gray box, but it's phenomenal. Again, just a huge hats off to our uh, uh, engineering teams at Carrier, but um, they have launched this new product, which you literally just plug into an uh, electrical outlet and it begin scrubbing or cleaning the air. Uh, and so it can have multiple, you know, not just in commercial buildings, but in dentist office and, um, you know, many different locations, that type of box could be used. Certainly also it was initially developed um, for hospitals because it also is a negative air scrubber um, or, or negative pressurization um, uh, capability. But, you know, again, improving occupant wellness can be done with a variety of our different uh, capabilities. Uh, and certainly outside of carrier as well, as, as was previously shown by Larry and John. Um, occupants also want to be able to, in a healthy building to be comfortable, um, you know, thermally comfortable. So one of the things that we have uh, developed is uh, you see these uh, series of smartphones at the bottom. Uh, essentially what that is, um, is our building services mobile platform. We call it My Way but you're able to go into your own smartphone. You don't have to touch any buttons or whatever. You go into your own smartphone and you're able to adjust uh, you, the temperature in your space in an office or you know, some other building that you're in, but yeah, your confined area, you can adjust your, your temperature. And then lastly, safety and security, we, from a healthy perspective, we have a lot of touchless access capabilities um, so that you know, occupants can navigate through a building without having to touch surfaces. So I thought um, what I'd like to do here is just kind of give you, uh, you know, bring it all home and give you an, uh, a real example of how a healthy building um, can be delivered, but also be high performing and also resilient, particularly in these times of COVID. So we um, uh, opened our uh, world headquarters, or I should say the Center for Intelligent Buildings, the CIB, which serves as Carrier's world headquarters. There's about, I work in this building, um, it's in South Florida, about 225,000 square feet uh, inside. Um, and it did receive uh, one of the highest uh, accreditations, the US uh, or the USGBC's LEED Platinum version floor. Uh, so we were actually the very first commercial building in Florida to receive this kind of accreditation. So I wanted just to focus um, again, very quickly uh, as I'm trying to wrap up here for the operational efficiency um, angle as well as the occupant experience angle, uh, how we address both of those in the CIB. Um, there was a vision for our, our developing our Center for Intelligent Buildings in South Florida and operational efficiency and occupant experience were paramount. So for operational efficiency, um, we looked at the products that we put inside, which are, you know, 
certainly our chiller plants, LED lighting systems, VRF. We have regenerative elevators, which we use as the elevator when it goes down, it recharges it to go back up. Um, we also layered on top of that some of our um, amazing um, advanced controls. So we have building uh, system controls to look at occupancy and uh, shut down lights or shut down uh, areas um, for HVAC uh, not being needed or used in certain areas. Um, and then we also have a, a very large uh, solar panel array uh, on top of our parking lot. And really what's amazing about that is that on a really bright day, which we have uh, in Florida often, um, you know, these, these panels would um, operate one of our chillers and um, it actually offset about 28% uh, well, of our energy costs. So what that amounts to is because of the design and because of the products and the control, advanced controls that we put into it, um, the CIB was really designed to have 60% um, less energy uh, costs than a standard office building and um, with bottom line savings. And this also, um, the CIB also, like I said, was envisioned to deliver an unparalleled uh, occupant experience. And we didn't know COVID was happening, but a lot of these, and, and nor did anybody else, but it was designed to be resilient. Um, and, and some of the things that we did as earlier, I showed um, all of those smartphones and, and that was the, the My Way app that we have. We actually use that application on our smartphones in the building. We can call elevators from our phone. Um, enter uh, doors um, using our phones with, you know, touchless access. We can, you know, do meetings from the phone. So it really creates a highly productive environment for our employees, um, but also one that is healthy. Um, and also based on uh, the COG FX study, we actually made the changes to the building and applied the enhanced ventilation rates to the CIB, which is really has proved out through different studies um, to provide, uh, you know, uh, a more uh, high productivity um, environment and uh, lower absenteeism in our office. So with that, I just wanted to say thanks for the opportunity to present and I look forward to uh, some of the questions we get later. Thank you so much, Rachel. There's a lot of rich content. We're kind of running slow on, on time. On time. I want to just quickly say that I think this is an ecosystem of, of, of um, organizations trying to get this done right. So we appreciate all the innovation you're doing there. There's a business case that has to be built up for all those kinds of um, investments you just talked about in that building. That's what John and I talk about all the time. And we needed more people to start thinking about those business cases. And early on, before COVID, air quality and energy were two things you had to manage together to really be effective as a building owner. Um, Chris, we're going to, you know, sorry for the time, but we're, we're going to count on you to bring it home with the lead that you're providing in the city and, and the scale. How do we scale this? How do we get all this wonderful innovation to be translated across the ownerships and, and what, what's the role of the city and what do you guys want to see out of this and, and support. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Devesh. Thank you to the NAOP team in Orlando for continuing to push high performance buildings here uh, in our city. And I'm really impressed by the fellow panelists, the information that was shared today, especially some of the cutting edge technologies we've also been looking at, but with John and Larry and Rebecca, you all shared around what you all are, are implementing as practitioners is, is really encouraging, uh, I think, for us and, and probably everybody on the call. Uh, obviously, cities around the world have been completely disrupted. And quite frankly, we're still not fully aware of the extent of the impact, the economic impact, the public health impact on our communities and our people's livelihoods, unprecedented um, obviously unemployment rates and, and frankly, we're, we're still really trying to figure out how we're going to get out of this. Um, but that's why I think the question around greater resilience has never been more important and relevant to, than today. You know, when I think about this term of resiliency, I, I think about our immune system. It's basically the immune system of our city, our building, us as individuals, the adaptive capacity of our organizations to handle any type of disruption, uh, including these global pandemics or climate impacts, but also these longer term challenges that we're faced with in cities around affordable housing and homelessness and inequalities. Um, you know, what COVID certainly has done is uncovered the interconnectedness of public health, of environmental health, and of economic health, right? Comes back to the triple bottom line of sustainability of people, planet, and prosperity, and the importance. And, and at its core, COVID is a respiratory disease. 
It's one that is further exacerbated, especially with populations who have been exposed uh, to poor air quality or to pollutants from fossil fuel combustion, uh, and hence why uh, this crisis has actually underscored how um, it's, uh, it's underscored the importance of the work that we've been doing in Orlando to transition towards uh, a cleaner and more uh, sustainable energy economy. Um, the other challenge that this has uncovered is the importance or, or kind of the, the social inequalities that that we're faced within our communities. Obviously, there are certain demographics in the community who are disproportionate. So as we look to whatever a new normal looks like or whatever building back better looks like, uh, we need to be deliberate at integrating dialogues, even as, as high as the, as the US Congress to figure out what is it that we can do as a country to restart us back in the right direction. Um, you know, in, in Orlando, we're also still learning from you know, what this response means to get back into our own uh, facilities. We've been really relying on the ASHRAE standards that have been coming out, uh, as well as, you know, many of the things that have been shared by our federal panelists around enhanced MERV filters, uh, really leveraging our BAS systems in the buildings to identify commissioning opportunities before we start to make these changes. And, and John, I think, as you mentioned, the buildings that um, that we've retrofitted that, that are more efficient are, are, you know, playing a critical role in mitigating the energy use spikes that we're going to see from enhanced ventilation and, and bringing in more outdoor air. And so there's a direct tie in to that. Um, so Orlando, you know, more importantly, as a city, though, we're really focused on what are the policies and programs that are enablers to accelerate high performance, resilient, healthy buildings in our city. And many of you are aware that we've been at this for quite some time over the last five years have really prioritized building efficiency and climate action uh, through a program called the City Energy Project, which really helped us begin to look at what this ecosystem of policies and programs will be. And so you've probably heard of our green bond, the $17.5 million green bond that we took out to invest in our own city buildings. We're now tracking at a 23% savings compared to the baseline in those facilities, a, an incredible amount of savings. Uh, we enabled pace and self-financing. Most people didn't realize that cities were in the game of enabling capital, but we realized that that was a big barrier of entry to incorporate uh, some of these technologies. And so we're fortunate to have seen about 18 million plus dollars of investment over the last three years, leveraging those financing tools to make our homes and our commercial office buildings uh, more resilient. Uh, the big one that a lot of us that NAOP was very much engaged in early, you know, early on and throughout the process was our benchmarking policy. Uh, BUS, which continues to be successful, we're now in our third year. And even during COVID, we're getting significant amount of buildings who are reporting their benchmarking, uh, which is a big deal. And this year kickstarts the energy audit and or retro commissioning requirements for buildings under the, the national average. So um, that's also been shown to be a major policy driver. Um, so, so those are some of the things we've been doing, but I want to close out in talking about some exciting things that we're about to uh, announce and, and, and come forward to the marketplace. First of all, the cities always need to lead by example. I'm a, you know, a huge proponent of that, and so is Mayor Dyer. Anything that we're going to move forward in the community, we need to be walking the walk ourselves. And so we are in the process of increasing our minimum standard for city-owned development properties uh, to a lead silver minimum. Uh, over the last 20 years, or the last 10 years, we've built 20 high-performance LEED certified buildings from venues to fire stations to community centers. And now, in addition to the LEED Silver Minimum, obviously within LEED, we're very focused on the energy and atmosphere credits and ensuring um, uh, that the performance of the facility is first and foremost efficient. But we're also making them solar ready and EV ready, so we're incorporating design specifications for those. We can land those technologies upon construction. That's great. If not, we'll make sure that they're ready to do so and more cost effectively. Um, but the exciting thing for the market is we have been exploring this for about eight months of a new incentive program, actually a green building incentive program that will, of course, uh, incorporate healthy buildings as well. And the idea is that, you know, the city is interested in, in leveraging um, property tax rebates as a form of OSPEC. If we can figure out a way to make it a no-brainer for developers and building systems uh, and, and at the same time help achieve our long-term goals as a city. Because as you mentioned, Devesh, 
in addition to dealing with the short term right now, we have to continue to look long term about sustaining our economy, sustaining the water resources that run our economy, energy and the like. So uh, you will soon hear about a, a new green building incentive program, again, encouraging new development within the city. Uh, it will be applicable for commercial and multifamily and really focused on achieving third party certifications and, um, and providing a sliding scale of property tax rebates back to those developers uh, to, to make the economics work even better. So that's really exciting. And then secondly, we are uh, exploring with OUC, our utility, a new retrofit program uh, um, that essentially will in the future leverage build solutions. So you might've heard of on-bill financing programs in other parts of the country. Uh, we have an on-bill financing program uh, called Efficiency Delivered for residential and multifamily properties. And so it's really focused on very low cost weatherization improvements and repaying on the utility bill but we've been working on expanding that scope and exploring what does it mean at a, in a commercial level to, to make these investments and share savings over time and be able to pay back on the utility bill, therefore making it much easier and, and less of a barrier for these owner operators to make that we've identified that fall within a good payback period that's comfortable for the utility and now working through some of the internal mechanics of how that might work. So we feel that with a new incentive program for new development and a new retrofit program for existing buildings, we can continue to build out that ecosystem of policies and programs that will drive these high performance developments uh, within Orlando. So that's what I wanted to share with you. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Devesh, if we have some time to dive into some questions. Thank you again for the, for the opportunity to join you. Thank you so much. This has been such great uh, interconnected content, and I think we're going to move over to questions. Uh, Chris, I'm personally excited about your property tax uh, incentive because, you know, as, as a PACE financing company, one of the things we do, we increase the amount you pay on taxes. There's a good offset there. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Amy, do you want to, I'll just hand it over to you if you wanted to address any of the questions that came up. Sure. Our first question is from Wayne Allred with TLC Engineering Solutions. And the question is for John Scott. John, how important is the recommissioning effort in determining how the building is operating prior to making adjustments? Oh, wow. That, that's, that's a really great question. Um, first off, setting the basis for the building, you, unless you can measure something, you can't improve it. So I think it's so important for us to understand how our buildings are performing. I operate with most of my ownerships on continuous commissioning, uh, which is my favorite one where we're staying in front of it. But a lot of times people have it set from when a building's delivered and then they have people that are tinkering with it over time. And by the time you go and you want to look at recommissioning of it and you take the readings, the building is not functioning uh, according to the original specs probably 95% of the time. And so my, my recommendations have always been get the building reset to its base design levels and then measure it from there and what your changes are going to be for a retro commissioning and see how the building has changed the occupants. So we've been going through densification over the past few years. Will that change because of COVID? No one knows, but I think it will. So we've been densifying and have using the same systems, but we made no changes to the controls, no changes to uh, the elevator systems. And densification has increased the transport uh, reliability on elevators. So there are so many factors involved with it. So measuring, finding out what your basis is, resetting the basis, and then go into retro commissioning is uh, typically the way I would ask someone to go forward. Hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, John. Our next question is from Bob Moser with CPC. Um, this question's for Larry or other panelists that want to chime in. What resources are available to office property owner operators to finance what looks like some high upfront costs for upgrades to energy efficiency, resiliency, and air quality in a building? How do owners that may be struggling with rent delinquencies right now make that investment? And I'll take that one. Uh, is my uh, sound okay? Everybody hear me? Great. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is it's not easy unless you have a well-leased portfolio with at least a number of tenants that are credit worthy enough to be able to pay rent. In our case, uh, we were lucky that we were going into this with a high level of occupancy 
Uh, we had refinanced a lot of our properties, so we have the cash flow to be able to pay for these new systems that are going to be required to deal with COVID. Offsetting this has been the fact that our occupancies have dropped significantly, so we've had a lot of energy savings going into this uh, as, a, as a result of this. Uh, we, we had it going in because we installed energy efficient chillers and energy management systems and the like, and then post-COVID, our occupancies have dropped to such a degree that lighting, equipment, et cetera, elevatoring uh, energy use has gone dramatically down. But there are no government subsidies that I am aware of uh, that are actually funding the costs of dealing with COVID. Uh, the, we're looking into going forward with our, our leases, having a clause that will allow us to amortize new systems. So for example, if we were to install this UV lighting system throughout our, our, our uh, venting, throughout our ductwork in the building, which is one option, uh, that could cost several hundred thousand per building. We, going forward, we want to be able to pass through that expense over a long-term lease. So if it were a 10 or 15 year lease, if the equipment had a 10 to 20 year lifetime, we'd pass it through over that lifetime. But other than that, I'm not aware of any government subsidies for COVID or the related pandemic. Um, does anybody else want to chime in? I know that uh, uh, I'll just take a cue from uh, Chris. You mentioned uh, that you've enabled Pace in Orlando. Tampa doesn't have it yet. While we have examples today from Tampa, Orlando's kind of leading on a lot of this, but I think, you know, providing on-bill financing, providing um, energy savings agreements, uh, and then Pace, anything that can off balance sheet that can, can address the short-term paybacks or provide some, some you know, a room to, to navigate for these folks to make these investments. I think they are out there. It's a matter of exposure and education, so we probably all should, should help with that. Uh, but Devesh, can I jump in on that? Yes, please, please. Yeah, so, so Larry's mentioning the lease. I think that's a critical component, and I've been an advocate nationally for green leases to be developed that follow this same pattern. And in the lease, it shows that if you can propose some type of technology or renovation that over time is going to reduce the cost and keep the cost covered through this. And to your point, Larry, it, it may be a five-year lease, seven-year lease, whatever the term is, uh, that you're, the ownership can go forward with doing it. And I used to utilize that in the 90s when it was prevalent to do, hey, lighting retrofits back in the day when that was difficult to get financed. So I think the green lease component of it, and to your point, the commercial pace program, which again, Chris and, and Orlando have been the lead, and I know uh, that we're doing it in multiple other areas now too, but those are two components that can take it either off balance sheet or pass it through without an increase in cost. So I think those should be focused on first and then go for outside financing after that. Mm -hmm. And the other option, if those don't work, that we've seen private, more on the private side is the energy saving performance Yeah. Yep. Uh, PSPCs, you know, there are third party firms who bring capital, you know, will do performance where they see savings to investment ratios greater, you know, cash flowing and, and, and can essentially share those savings with, you know, as the best mentioned, kind of off balance sheet financing. So there are some things out there uh, and we're going to continue to explore others like this on bill financing because I, I truly believe that, you know, there's still barriers of entry, which each one of those, it's not as none of them are a silver bill, bullet solution for anyone. And and uh, but but having the utilities ability to to offer up um, you know those those retrofits those improvements and the repayment on the utility bill has shown to be very effective in other parts of the country and if you can you can get it at scale or you can capital stack it with pace and maybe other things you can really start to see deep retrofits um, happening. Okay, great. Um, last call for questions. We have one for Devesh. What municipalities in our immediate area have approved commercial PACE financing? Uh, in Central Florida, all of Osceola County, all of Brevard, uh, Winter Park, Orlando, Apopka, um, uh, Longwood, uh, Sanford, Oviedo, uh, in Volusia, there are a couple cities as well, New Smyrna Beach, Edgewater, Daytona, Daytona Beach Shores. So I can provide that, but we, we're, we're working with Orange County right now to kind of get the rest of the county in. 
So some of the smaller cities and the unincorporated areas of the county and Seminole County would be next. I think they've got an energy element in their comp plan. So they're starting to look at this again, um, but I'm happy to answer those questions offline. Thank you for that. All right, Lindsay, did you wanna mention anything? No, thank you all for chiming in today. Thank you to our panelists and our moderators and to everyone who logged in this over their lunch break. Thank you. Have a